All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is lovely to be um, here virtually again. Um, we were just talking about Zoom and getting Zoom to operate properly uh, for yet another uh, fantastic uh, Robotics Institute seminar here at the University of Toronto. And today, a uh, special treat, we have a wonderful speaker, uh, Professor Henny Admani from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. You may have heard of this institution. It is located in uh, Pittsburgh. You might have heard the name in the past. Um, Henny works on a whole variety of really fascinating stuff. And I'm, I'm going to give Henny, a, uh, or I should say Professor Admani, a huge shout out because she has a fantastic bio. So I'm going to read the bio <laughs> right now. And uh, so uh, Dr. Henny Mani is the uh, A. Nico Haberman uh, Assistant Professor in the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon, uh, where she leads the Human and Robot uh, Partners Lab. Um, and her research interests include human-robot interaction, assistive robotics, nonverbal communication, and several other things. Uh, she holds a PhD in computer science from Yale, another institution you may have heard of potentially, uh, and a, a BAMA joint de degree from uh, Wellesley University. This bio is wonderful because it is such a modest bio that belies so many other like awards, other fantastic things that, that is not mentioned in this bio. So compliments to you, Professor Admani, for having a short, sweet bio that just lays out the basics and, you know, is, is very, very modest and very, very approachable i love it way to go on that on that <laughs> note <laughs> on that note um also i i promised henny uh that i would ship maple syrup i think uh, for this talk so um i believe there's an email that i circulated to you where i promised free maple syrup in exchange for this presentation That's probably and why I, agree. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think you did agree for that reason yes so uh it's on the way excellent or it, or it will be. It's just checks in the mail. <laughs> Possibly at the next physical conference I see you at. Anyway, all right. On that note, um, it is my uh, great pleasure to uh, turn the controls over to uh, to uh, Professor Admani, and uh, she will tell us some wonderful things about uh, uh, HRI and other things. Okay, whenever you're ready. Wonderful. Thank you, Professor Kelly, um, <laughs> for that lovely introduction and uh, and the hype. The hype was impressive. So. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is a, a pleasure to get to talk to people. And the one silver lining of the pandemic, I think, is that I get to visit with lots more people than I would otherwise. I am going to share my screen, which for those of you on Zoom will take over your computer um, so that I can get started with my slides. All right. So as Jonathan said, um, I work in the space of human-robot interaction. And I'm particularly interested in how we can build better collaborative and assistive robots by using what we know about people to make those robot algorithms work better. So I wanna start this talk by having you all imagine your favorite robot. Um, and this can be a robot from the media, the books, TV, movies, whatever, it's fine. Not all of us have met a robot in real life. So just picture your favorite robot. Um, here are some options, some of my favorite robots. And um, maybe your robot is on this you know, on this slide, maybe not. Um, but probably your favorite robot is one that is helpful to people. Um, you know, we have robots that provide assistance, that provide um, information, that support crew members on a ship, um, that provide health care and other kinds of help to people. Um, if your favorite robot is not one that helps people, then I don't know how to help you. Um, but today, this talk is going to be about robots that help people. And in order to uh, to build such robots, why we need to know about people. So I'll start with this umbrella of collaborative robotics, uh, of which assistive robotics is a part or is related. So in, in collaborative robotics, we have this notion that there's a human and a robot, maybe multiple humans and multiple robots, but let's just assume for now, one human and one robot, and they're each working together toward um, their own respective goals that may or may not interact, intersect. So we have, uh, let's formalize this a little bit. We have a human, the other way. We have a human being, a user, you, um, that is capable of um, different actions. So the user actions are you. We have a robot that's capable of robot actions, which may or may not be the same as the user actions. And they exist inside a space, um, an environment, um, and they have some kind of shared 
um, mutual state that includes the state of the user, the state of the robot, and the state of the environment. I've already made a mistake. The user you is not the user actions. It re you represents the user, R represents the robot. Now, the user in this situation has some kind of goal. Um, and the goal here is we formalize as um, getting to a particular mutual state, so a certain S sub M. And what's interesting about collaboration is that the robot, oh, sorry, the, the human is um, capable of producing actions uh, that transition the system, this entire system, from one state to another. The robot might have its own set of goals. And what's important about collaboration is that these goals don't necessarily have to align with the user's goals. At some level they do, but the robot might have its own plan that it's executing separately. And the robot has its own set of actions that it can perform. So this is about collaboration. In assistive systems, we uh, think about systems that are a little bit different. Uh, and the key way that they're different is that the robot's goal is no longer independent of the user. Um, so we think about autonomous robots or partially autonomous robots that can perform their own actions but are subordinate in goal to a human user. Um, and that's the, these are the kinds of interactions that I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, and also importantly, in these kinds of assistive robotic systems, we want to maintain as much user autonomy as possible. So it, a lot of times, you know, having autonomous robots take over might be the answer, but actually in the systems that I'm gonna talk about today, there's this implicit goal that we want to keep the human in the loop. And we wanna keep the human's actions, um, uh, action space as available as possible. So the goal of the assistive robot is to take its own actions that move the state of the world toward the user's goal while maintaining the user's independence and working around them. Um, and of course, I mentioned before that we have a user you, you will, which is an element of this big user set. There might be more than one person involved in this interaction. Um, and so the robot needs to account for all of these potential users in while it's providing this kind of assistance. So if you look at this system, we have a robot, we have um, a person the robot is helping, we have a space in which that help is being provided, a state of the world. Um, and that state of the world changes over time. And so my research looks at this concept, uh, this space of robot assistants that help people through space and time. And we've recently formalized this notion of robot assistants in along these three dimensions. So the people the robot is helping, the space in which that help is being provided, and the time uh, during the task with, that the robot helps. And this, um, looking at the kind of research that we do along these three axes allows us to compare different kinds of assistive systems that might occur in different domains. So for example, how do you compare a powered wheelchair that avoids obstacles to an educational robot? Both are assistive, but um, on their face don't have the same characteristics. But when you start looking at who, what kind of people are involved, what is the space of the interaction and over what time scale does that interaction take place? Um, you can start making comparisons absent the domain. So let me tell you a little bit about each of these different axes and how we've uh, formalized them or grouped them. Um, and we'll start with people, right? The question is, who does the robot work for? Um, who's involved in the task? And what role does that person play in the interaction? The sort of most obvious one is the target of assistance. Um, a target of assistance is uh, the person whose goals the robot is supporting. So remember before we had a user U with a particular uh, goal state and that user is the target of assistance. So there has to be one for this to be an assistive interaction. But there are often other people in the world um, and those other people can also be involved in the interaction. And we call those other people interactants. So this is anybody who's involved in the situation who is not explicitly a target. Um, maybe this is uh, people walking around in the world around a powered wheelchair that avoids obstacles. Um, and finally, we have a third sort of category of people, which is the additional target of assistance. Now, the additional target of assistance 
um, is somebody else who's receiving help from the robot, but whose goals aren't necessarily the ones the robot is subordinate to. Um, so if you think about this in terms of social navigation, for example, um, let's say we're in a restaurant, the target of assistance might be a patron seated at a table. The additional targets of assistance might be the table mates around that patron who are engaged in the interaction and might also be benefiting from the robot's assistance. And the interactants are other patrons at other tables. Um, so when robots are providing assistance, they need to consider not just their target, but also these other people. And it's especially challenging when the additional targets of assistance have goals that are uh, that don't align with the primary target. Um, figuring out you know, who the robot works for is really uh, important, and it's not always the person who you think is getting the help from the robot. So that is people. Um, robots also help through performing actions in the world. Um, and we think about this, the space of robot actions, at, or the space of assistance, um, again, along three dimensions. The first one is actually not physically manipulating anything in the world. The robot can provide assistance by changing something inside the human brain. Now, I don't mean like, you know, medically, but the robot might inform somebody of some information. It might tell them that an obstacle is coming up or um, remind them about a meeting that they have um, or, uh, you know, point out to them uh, something, uh, something they didn't see in the environment. So robots that provide assistance to people where the assistance changes something that somebody knows or desires um, are providing assistance in the human brain space. We also have robots that provide assistance on the human body itself. Um, so exoskeletons are a great example of this. Again, power wheelchairs. And then we have robots that are providing assistance by changing the environment. Um, so this is, you know, delivery robots, um, collaborative robots that bring you a tool when you're building something. Um, so we can think about this, the space of assistance as occurring kind of across these different um, categories, and some robots will help across multiple categories. And finally, um, we have the time axis. So we talked about people, space, and now I'll talk about time, which is when during the human's execution of a task, does the robot provide its assistance? So a lot of robots are reactive, which is to say that the human provides a command or explicitly executes an action, and then the robot re responds to that by taking its own action. Um, and so, you know, we can model these as turn-taking um, interactions or um, uh, kind of uh, other kinds of like human-led interactions. Um, but sometimes we want the robot to act simultaneously. So let's say, for example, as in the simple diagram, the human and the robot are moving a table together. Um, the robot should not be reactive in that case. You want the robot's assistance to be simultaneous with the human's performance of the task. And the sort of um, gold standard or goal that we have often in robotics is to actually make robots proactive. So. Um, robots that are capable of providing assistance before the human needs to explicitly task them with that kind of assistance. So maybe we have a robot that um, brings a glass of water before we've asked it uh, to go get that glass of water because it knows that we might be thirsty. So this sort of, um, these three categories outline the spectrum of time. So we've talked about um, the notion of assistance as occurring with people in some kind of space and across some time. And um, that's gonna be kind of the, the high level um, framework of the rest of the talk. I'm gonna talk to you about the robotics that I do, um, which is primarily in the space of assistance and collaboration. Um, so I work on a lot of different kinds of applications. Today, I'm gonna talk about three specific applications. Um, one is about social robots to support conversational agency for people with severe speech impairments. The second will be about robot manipulators that help people um, with severe upper motor impairment do activities of daily living. And the third one is going to be about um, AI learning systems that can make their own policies transparent to users 
um, to increase robot explainability and interpretability. Um, and with each of these three, I'm going to highlight these, this notion of people, space, and time. So each one of these projects um, represents a, a useful insight or a useful um, uh, example of one of those three axes that we think about when we think about assistance. Um, so I should say, uh, for those of you who are on Zoom, feel free to ask questions in the chat. I have it up. And um, I guess for those of you who are remote, I don't know if there's a question mechanism, but I'm sure Kimberly is on top of it. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's talk about this first application area, which is about conversational agents, um, conversational agency in augmentative and alternative communication devices. So just to give you a bit of background, um, there are um, many, many, oh, you'll put, oh, Kimberly will post questions from YouTube here. Perfect. So feel free to ask questions on YouTube as well. Um, I told you, she was on top of it. Um, our most famous AAC user is probably Stephen Hawking. Um, he used a computer device where he could type out answers and it would speak out loud for him. Many, many people in the world use um, these kinds of devices or some variant of them in order to produce speech. Um, and the challenge with these devices is that producing speech with them is much slower than voiced speech typically. And so um, people who use AAC devices will often get left out of conversations um, or will have a situation where the conversation moves on before they get a chance to contribute. Um, and that reduces their ability to be fully participating members of a conversation. So let me show you an example. Um, in these images, uh, you see an augmented communicator. She's using a uh, joystick with her right hand and a button um, and her AAC device to select uh, words in order to speak out loud. Um, and so we call the AAC user an augmented communicator and the AAC device, um, we call it that. So in this, I'm gonna play a video now. Um, seated next to her is her father. And in this video, about 30 seconds long, um, the uh, experimenter in our study has just asked a question about how our augmented communicator uses her um, AAC device on the internet. And so what you're gonna see is the augmented communicator start to type uh, an answer to the question while her father um, begins to answer it himself. Instagram, she does everything but she only uses it like a typewriter. And it's Bluetooth connected to the computer. Uh, so this she could use like that. Mm -hmm. But when your communication device. OK, so we're going to speed up the video a little bit. You can see um, that is continuing on. And you can see the words appearing on the screen. Our augmented communicator is typing. Um, but by the time she finishes typing, the conversation has moved on. I can, but I haven't explored the internet. She can use this. And we do go on the internet for all her updates. So it's not uncommon to have situations like this where augmented communicators don't get the chance to speak because they're, um, the, the speech isn't produced quickly enough. So we were thinking about technological solutions to this. and. You know, one approach is to make the AAC device faster um, to type on, and lots of people are exploring that space. But when we took a step back and reflected on this interaction, we noticed that this is a really interesting triadic interaction. This conversation is made up of three people. We have an augmented communicator who is the center of the conversation. We have most often a close conversational partner. This could be a family member or a paid aide who uh, often accompanies the augmented communicator when they're out and about in the world. And then we have some kind of third party. In this case, it's our experimenter who's in engaging with the AC. And if you change these names a little bit, if you remember what I just said about the um, axes, axis of people in assistance, we can think about each of these as uh, one member of that axis. So we have the target of assistance, who's obviously the AC. We have our additional target of assistance, who is the close conversational partner. And we have the interactants, um, the person who is um, 
kind of influenced by the um, assistive device, but not directly benefiting from it. And so um, this is a nice example of the different roles that people can take around an assistive device. So when we were doing this research, what we noticed in these interactions is that the CCP is actually doing a lot of heavy lifting. Um, they are providing a lot of support to the AC in terms of interpreting nonverbal utterances, or like you saw in the video, kind of keeping the conversation going while the AC uh, types out an answer. So we analyzed the interactions between these close conversational partners and their augmented communicators. And what we found is that when augmented communicators had CCPs that were close to them, like family members, um, they ended up using a much richer amount of communication than when their CCPs were less close, like paid aides. So in this graph, you can see um, we have a bar, a stacked bar graph that represents the number of speaking turns that the AC user took. Um, and the type of speaking turn is indicated by the color of the bar. Um, we have four pairs of ACs and augmented communicators, P1 to 4, and they did four different tasks, which is why there are four bars in each section. So the first two pairs involved a CCP that was a parent. Um, and you can see that there's lots of uh, gestures and vocalizations in addition to the traditional speaking through the augmented uh, communication device. Whereas for CCPs who, who were paid aides, um, the augmented communicators relied a lot more on using their device directly to speak. Um, so this was interesting because we wondered how we can um, get the benefit of a familiar CCP in order to pro um, provide ACs the opportunity to have such a rich interaction, um, so, such rich interaction modalities. Now we know from robotics that um, we can get technological devices, we can get robots that help people um, engage in conversation using nonverbal behaviors. Um, in particular, we've seen in the past that robots can use their eye gaze and head position to hold the conversational floor, for example, by looking away during an utterance, or um, robots can use their gaze and gesture to redirect someone's attention to an area of interest. And building on these, we were wondering whether we could build a robot sidekick, a social robot that would um, work for the AC um, and support them in their conversational agency by using some of these nonverbal communication modalities. So in order to develop this kind of robot, we uh, took a participatory design approach. We ran a workshop with a pair of augmented communicators and their close conversational partners. Um, and we also invited three puppeteers to this workshop. And the puppeteers were there because they are experts in communicating through movement. And the teams here, the groups were tasked with developing uh, prototypes, very lo-fi prototypes of augmented communicator support sidekicks. So build some kind of sidekick agent or some kind of tool that would help the augmented communicator um, maintain their role in the conversation and feel like they could contribute meaningfully. Um, and so after our day long workshop, here's what came out of it. On the right, you can see pictures of um, the lo-fi prototypes that our augmented communicators came up with. So we had lots of crafts and glitter glue and things like that for them to, to use. Um, and you can see they both came up with a sort of sign-like modality. One had um, you know, eyes and was very anthrop you know, kind of anthropomorphic and the other was more of like a, a warning sign. But both of them um, were you know, had actuation that the puppeteers added. And when we um, investigated what people thought the robot sidekicks could do for them in their daily life, we, we came up with four general categories of task that people wanted robot sidekicks to fill the silence gap. So as you saw, take over some of that conversational floor holding while they typed, um, indicate that the augmented communicator wanted to take a turn to speak and that people should wait for them, um, soften a message. So um, a lot of times there's not a lot of inflection on the, the voice from the AAC device. Um, and so things can sound harsher than they might otherwise be. 
And finally, invite the partner to look at the screen. So our ACs didn't always want people to look at their screen, but sometimes it was faster than having to fully type something out and announce it to the world. Um, and so they wanted the, the ability to um, dynamically ask someone to look at the screen. So based on these um, abilities and these prototypes, we kind of dug deep with one particular AAC user and did a case study on what would it take to build this kind of robot sidekick for him. Um, and after much iteration, we developed this extremely simple 3D printed um, arm, waving arm essentially, that um, it actuated itself in a number of different ways to convey different messages. So for example, it could convey, um, I'm typing, hold on, or it could convey, you know, okay, or calm down, or um, it could convey, I would like to speak by, by rising and waving. Um, and so um, my brilliant students did, developed and 3D printed and wired up and uh, delivered this simple robot to our AC. And our brilliant AC used it for two months in his classes, in his nonprofit meetings, um, and in other environments with, other, with his friends. And we analyzed through surveys every, once, every few weeks um, how he was using the device. And what we saw is that um, for this particular user, this robot sidekick actually did help improve his agency through his own reports. So he reported that he um, was able to uh, indicate to people more that he wanted a turn and was able to kind of request that they stop and wait for him more often. What was interesting is that this effect was actually mediated by the relationship. So the closer people were to him, the better the robot worked. Um, in fact, he used it one day with his mom. His mom was, uh, a, I believe, a participant in our uh, workshop, and she was really surprised that he would use it with her because she thought that she understood all of his signals and why would he need to use this new device with her. Um, but he did, and it seemed very effective. So it's not exactly the technology that we wanted because we want um, people who are further away from the individual to get the benefit out of this device. But um, the, the more people understand the user, the more they're able to interpret the robot's signals. So that um, was an example of the role of people in assistance. Um, and this was a fun project with a human computer interaction collaborators that, um, that really looked at how to design robots for, you know, for users using this kind of participatory approach. Um, we also work in my lab in a sort of separate space, which is the space of AI and learning from people. So um, in this second project that I wanna talk to you about, um, this, is robot, this is work that looks at how robots or AI in this case can communicate to people their own internal policies in order to make them more transparent for human users. Um, so imagine that you're trying to teach somebody how to swing a baseball bat. Um, you, you, know, you teach them for a while and then you ask them to show you what they've learned. Um, this is a really common mechanism of teaching. Uh, driving exams are another great example, right? If you learn how to drive, you do your hours on the road, you practice, and then you go and take an exam. And in a limited number of situations, your examiner observes your behavior and is able to say from that limited number of demonstrations that you are likely to be capable of handling a large range of driving situations and we should give you your license. So demonstrations in representative scenarios are a way that people are used to conveying their own policy, their own abilities and, and actions. But demonstrations can vary a lot. Um, for example, in what's shown, in um, how the order of information gets conveyed, and so on. So what we were interested in is if we have a robot that, for example, has learned from human demonstration or has learned uh, a policy, or maybe has even been programmed with a policy, how can that robot intelligently demonstrate what it knows to a human so that its human collaborators can understand what it's capable of? Um, and this is important for human-robot trust. So if people understand where a robot is likely to fail, for example, 
um, it matters less that it has failed because they're able to predict that and it doesn't hurt trust as much. So our goal in this work is um, to develop uh, a system where an AI agent is able to provide a sequence of demonstrations to a human observer that are informative about the agent's underlying policy and also interpretable to the human being. Now, you know, communicating policies directly is obviously not um, human interpretable and conveying all possible demonstrations in all possible environments is going to be intractable. So how does the agent pick the right set of environments to, um, to show its skills to maximize human understanding? We, uh, for now, have implemented this work in a grid world domain. We're hoping to expand this in the future. Um, but uh, let me introduce you to the domain really quickly. We have a grid world where um, the agent can move up, down, left, and right. Its goal is to deliver the package represented by a purple circle um, to the destination, which is represented by a purple square, while avoiding any squares with um, yellow in them because those are tolls. And if possible, collecting the battery, which is the green, uh, I don't know, shape, <laughs> um, in order to uh, maximum, you know, get get some energy back. Um, so to we model this as a um, an MDP, this agent, and so this agent has some um, underlying reward that. Uh, we compute as a weighted combination of features along its particular trajectory, and it tries to maximize its reward at the end of this um, interaction, at the end of this run. So, for example, um, an optimal policy for this particular robot, given certain values of the features, is to uh, first go and pick up the passenger, then stop by the battery, then drop the passenger off at the goal. Um, in this case, we have three features, the number of tolls that the robot goes into, the number of batteries it picks up, and the number of actions. And each feature is weighted, so each feature has a different level of importance. And um, the goal here in this task is for the human observer, the learner, to uh, learn the feature weights. So to, to the, the observer does not know the feature values. It, they do know that there are three features, and the goal is to learn um, how important each feature is. So if you think back to our people, space, and time axes, um, this is a great example of how a robot might demonstrate um, information that would have assistive action inside the human's brain, right? So here the robot is trying to teach somebody something, um, which is a human brain action. So how do we understand what the robot is doing in the human brain? Um, so we, um, we build this uh, um, model of uh, demonstration informativeness. So before the human has seen any demonstrations, they are agnostic to uh, the weight values. So we can um, think about the relative values of all of the weights as represented by the surface of this unit sphere. So um, they, have, they have no particular... Um, knowledge about what weight uh, the robot actually has. And every time the robot gets a demonstration, um, this provides one or more constraints on the shape of the sphere that narrows down the space of possible reward weights. And we can do that using inverse reinforcement learning. Um, this is a technique that we are, are actually taking from prior work by Brown and Nikum. So let me give you an example. Um, say that the human just saw this demonstration uh, which is represented on the left. Now, um, the human has learned essentially two things from the demonstration. The first thing they've learned um, is that the um, toll is negative relative to um, the step cost. And in fact, the toll is at least two times as costly as taking a step because the agent takes twice as many steps as it needs to to avoid the toll. Um, so we, we can draw this blue plane um, that divides the, um, the space and only, oh, those arrows are going in the wrong direction, but only the values that are below the blue plane are valid because those are values where the toll is at least twice as costly as the step. 
The other thing that we've learned is that the robot's trying to minimize its actions. It's not running around the world, which means the step cost has to be negative. So we can draw a plane at um, the step cost equals zero uh, line and anything below that, anything that represents a negative step cost, negative step reward, excuse me, um, is, uh, uh, is valid for the agent's policy. Um, which means the agent's policy lives somewhere in this remaining space that was represented initially by our unit sphere. So we have quite a lot of space that has been cut out. And this space um, is right now, we call it a behavioral equivalence class. Um, so prior work in the field of inverse reinforcement learning has calculated the minimum number of demonstrations that you would need to pick the smallest behavioral equivalence class area, which would get the learner the closest to the true underlying reward that was being conveyed. So for example, um, in order to demonstrate certain values, um, the prior work uh, suggests that these two demonstrations that are shown on the screen are fully sufficient for the learner to have this, the best possible chance of knowing the underlying reward function. But these are actually kind of hard demonstrations. If you just received these two, it would be really tough to tell exactly what the relationship was between the weights. So our insight here is that while we can use inverse reinforcement learning as a starting point for modeling human understanding, um, humans are not pure IRL learners, and they can get overwhelmed by this small number of highly nuanced examples. And so what we're going to do is um, adapt the uh, prior work in developing uh, representative demonstrations to account for some of the things that people need. I saw a hand go up. Does someone you want to ask a question? Hi. Hey. Hi. Hi. Uh, hey. Um, so really enjoying the, the, the talk. I'm just wondering, um, what is, uh, is there any relationship to this and trying to reduce the entropy of the posterior mm -hmm. over possible parameters? Sorry, what's the relationship between this and reducing the entropy? Yeah, over the posterior of possible reward parameters. Um, let me go back. Yeah, I think that that is basically the same, right? Because you're trying to cut out, you're trying to maximize the informativeness of each uh, successive constraint. Um, in order to reduce the uncertainty. Got it. Yeah, yeah, cool. exactly. But people cannot handle it when you when you maximize the informativeness without considering the um, kind of needs of people. And so that brings me really nicely to the to the sort of insight that we had, um, which is that in order to make demonstrations human understandable, we can't just look at minimizing entropy, we have to also understand um, how people process information. Um, and so we looked to the um, literature on uh, learning sciences and found that, for example, when people are learning new visual things, um, we want to increase the simplicity of the visual information that's being provided. We want successive examples to be more similar to each other so that people can understand how concepts build on each other. And we want ideally to present um, information in a scaffolding manner. So we wanna present simpler examples before we present more complex examples so that people can build them up. That's great, thank you. Thanks. Um, so that's what we did. So we, um, we modified um, this IRL process to account for visual simplicity, similarity, and scaffolding. Um, so in visual simplicity and similarity, you can see if we, um, know we want to give demonstration two, and we have two options for what the prior demonstration, demonstration one would look like. Um, the demonstration option A includes uh, visual simplicity because it doesn't have any extra goal, uh, extra tolls that are not involved in the task. Um, and it is as similar, uh, it's similar to the demonstration two. We're just adding one extra toll to the environment. Whereas demonstration option B is not visually simple because it has extraneous features that don't get used and it visually is different from the following demonstration. And so we, um, in addition to cutting down the BEC area, we prioritize 
um, new demonstrations that involve visually simple and similar environments. And we also then employ a scaffolding approach based on the BEC area. So as the BC, BEC area gets smaller, um, the uh, demonstration becomes more and more complex because there are fewer and fewer possible um, hypotheses that can fit into um, that space. And so we use the BEC area as a measure of, scaff of um, demonstration complexity and then scaffolded by showing people simpler demonstrations from a larger BEC area that would yield a larger BEC area first and then incrementally scaffolding them down to demonstrations that would yield a smaller BEC area. We wanted to know if this worked, so we ran an online study with 162 participants. People watched uh, training videos of the agent providing demonstrations in a variety of different environments, representative environments, and then we asked them to show us what they thought the agent's policy would be in a new test environment. So they had to drive the agent around um, in the optimal path. And what we learned from this um, is, first of all, that BEC area was a good measure of um, environment complexity. So environments or um, environments with optimal paths that yielded larger BEC areas were easier to find the optimal path in than environments with uh, optimal paths that yielded the um, smallest BEC areas. So you can see that people's performance in selecting the optimal path went down as the BEC area uh, of that demonstration got smaller. We also saw that um, visual simplicity and similarity improves performance, but only when the task was hard. So in environments that where it was easy to find the optimal path, um, people really didn't need visual simplicity and similarity. But for um, environments for test environments that were difficult, um, having the agent provide examples in sequentially visually similar ways and in visually simple ways helped people perform better. But interestingly, our kind of key um, idea from this that scaffolding with BEC area would help wasn't actually true. Um, we did found that scaffolding actually did not have a significant effect on overall performance. So um, we thought that presenting simpler examples and then more difficult ones later, which we call forward scaffolding, would perform better than the reverse, which we call backward scaffolding. Um, but we didn't see that statistically significantly in the data. So what we learned from this work is that we can um, use this variant of IRL to model how people will interpret demonstrations from an AI system and use it to select demonstrations that will maximize human understanding, but that we have a little bit more to learn about how people need to receive information um, and for, for specifically how scaffolding might work. Um, and so our latest work is looking at counterfactual examples and trying not just to scaffold the knowledge absent what the user knows, but actually have our agent teacher monitor or like model the human's knowledge and present examples that are as different as possible from what the human already thinks is true. Okay. So that um, brings us to the, the third sort of application area that I wanna talk to you about. Um, so we had talked about uh, assistive systems for speech impairment. We had talked about um, assistive systems that make their own policy transparent to people through demonstration. And now I wanna talk about assistive systems that um, provide proactive manipulation assistance using IAS. So before I get um, into the specific contribution, I wanna to talk to you about the domain, which is assistive manipulation. Um, this is a domain that investigates robot manipulators to support people with, for example, upper motor impairment to achieve activities of daily living. Um, so the picture here you see is actually a commercial product called a Kenova robot. Arm, Canova is a company. Um, this is a Canova Jayco. It sits on a wheelchair for somebody with a motor impairment and they uh, control it with whatever controller they have to um, operate their wheelchair. So for example, they might use a joystick um, if they have enough control in their hand. Um, they might use a sip and puff, which is a straw that sits by your mouth and you blow out or you suck in and that's your entire control signal. Um, they might use a head array with buttons where you toggle for control. And they use that to drive the robot end effector, the robot hand. 
Now, the problem is, as you can tell, um, we have a dimensionality mismatch between our input and our output. So controlling the robot end effector is a six degree of freedom problem. You have to position it in X, Y, Z in physical space and also in pitch yaw roll for orientation. But these input devices are necessarily low dimensional because people who need this robot have limited physical capacity to control multiple dimensions simultaneously. And so um, what ends up happening is often these systems are controlled using a method called modal control, where um, you enter a particular mode and the um, degrees of freedom of your controller, for example, a joystick, are mapped to certain dimensions on the robot. And then you explicitly switch modes and the degrees of freedom get remapped to another pair of dimensions and so on and so forth. So in the video, um, you can see uh, admittedly an able-bodied novice, so not our target population, um, but certainly a convenience sample, um, trying to pour a pitcher of water. And you can see if, for those of you who aren't familiar with robot videos, you should always look for the speed up factor in the corner that represents how fast we had to make the video to fit it into our talk. Um, this is sped up to eight minutes. So you can tell this is quite a challenging and um, time consuming task. And so researchers have said, you know, instead of forcing the user to teleoperate the robot completely, what if we injected some kind of intelligence into the system that tried to predict what the user was doing with the robot and then provided some sort of um, assistance on top of the direct user control? Um, and so this is work that was done in the lab that I joined for my postdoc. And as part of my postdoc, I demonstrated through a user study that in fact, this shared autonomy system performed better uh, along a series of metrics than the direct teleoperation system. So here, for example, the user's goal is to spear a marshmallow from a plate. And you can see how in the shared autonomy case on the left, the user not only gets the robot into position quickly, but has a chance to change her mind a couple of times and gets the marshmallow before the teleoperated robot on the right even um, gets to spearing. So this is an interesting example. If you think back to our people, space, and time um, kind of uh, dimension analysis, this is an example of a simultaneously acting robot. Right? This is a robot that is providing assistance as the user is providing assistance. So they're um, working together, in this case, co-manipulating the end effector to achieve a task. But, you know, the signal that the robot is getting right now from the user is purely from the joystick. So the robot is using the joystick both to move and to predict the user's goal, um, which means we're leaving a lot of information on the table. And in particular, we're leaving this nonverbal signal of eye gaze out of the equation. And so my question was, what if we capture the user's eye gaze? Can we use that to tell what their target of manipulation is? And there's grounding for this um, from the uh, cognitive science research. So here's a video of um, a task that people were given to do that investigated how people's eye gaze was linked to their manipulation, their object manipulation. Um, and what they found is that people's eyes precede manipulation. People, you're, you will look at where you're going to reach before you start moving your hand. And then before you get to that location, your eyes will actually skip ahead to the next location. And so by invest by capturing eye gaze, we can actually use it to predict the target of manipulation because people will be looking at what they're reaching for. We said, great, what if we outfit our users with an eye tracker? What we found um, is that in this task, eye gaze doesn't behave the same as it does when people are reaching for objects with their own hands. Now, this is sort of obvious in retrospect. Um, we expected people to you know, look mostly at their uh, target, but in fact, people most looked mostly at the end effector of the robot because that's what they were controlling with the joystick. Um, and so uh, we ran into a bit of a problem where it became pretty hard to identify what the target was from this sparse gaze signal. Um, and in fact, we can quantify how sparse it is. So when we labeled the videos with different fixation locations that are identified by the colored shapes on the image, only 16% of the gaze fixations that we saw in our 24 person data set um, actually landed on the target 
goal piece of food. Um, so that's a pretty low number. And in fact, 10% of the time, in 10% of the trials, there were no goal-directed gazes at all. People weren't looking at their goal even once. Um, in these cases, we think they were using peripheral vision or memory because the pieces of marshmallow weren't moving. So we used a structure in computer science called a hidden Markov model because um, we have this noisy gaze signal. And we think that there's some underlying um, signal inside that noise that is uh, extended over time. So hidden Markov models are nice ways of trying to predict um, the next kind of signal, next state, using a um, noisy signal that is temporally extended. Um, and so we uh, accounted for this sequence of goal and non-goal gazes by first um, training a hidden Markov model for each of the potential goal targets, so each of the morsels on the plate, um, using that sequence of labels that we got from fixations. And then for every sequence, we provided a score um, that uh, by running that sequence of gaze through all three of our pre-trained HMMs. Um, and so each HMM, uh, sorry, each gaze sequence was then scored with how likely it was, what the probability was that that um, HMM yielded that sequence of gaze fixations. Um, and so we selected, we normalized, um, and we then predicted, the robot predicted that the human's goal was the goal that was most likely predicted by the three HMMs. Um, we found that this actually, this was an interesting um, signal because on the one hand, the gaze on average outperformed the joystick in predicting the user's goal. But that was, it was very bimodal. So when the gaze was wrong, it was very confident. The system was very confident about the wrong answer. And in this graph, you can actually see the, um, the probability that was assigned to the correct goal. Um, as a function of time, as a function of progress through the task. Um, and in these violin plots, you can see the mass of um, certainty in the sequential gaze, the dark blue uh, lines, as being this kind of bimodal shape where there was a lot of certainty or very little certainty in the um, probability assigned to the correct goal. Whereas joystick increased more slowly, but tended to be more right. So this suggests that eye gaze is a useful signal, but not the only signal that we should be using, um, and that it acts in a complementary way, potentially, to the joystick. And so our new research is looking at how do we take advantage of that complementarity to, um, to combine eye gaze and joystick for doing this kind of shared control. And it's not just eye gaze. Um, there's lots of signals that people give us when they're doing these kinds of shared manipulation tasks, from language to facial expression to body posture. And so we someday are hoping to use all of these kinds of nonverbal signals in a multimodal way to provide cues to when people need assistance. Florian, go ahead. Ooh, I can't hear you, but you're not muted. You're muted, Florian. Sorry, I'm, I was muted from this uh, from the mic. On your end, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, a lot of this has to do with the way that people provide uh you know their goal information about their goal location yeah. so for example if they could uh if they would know that the protocol for selecting an object would be you know uh fixate on visually fixate on the object and then press a button then you would have a lot more information about yes. that yes so uh, how do we how do we design a protocol that really really uh makes it easy yeah, that's a great question. So um, you are right that if people understood how the robot was interpreting the, the gaze and, and kind of adapted to it and learned that protocol that they would um, be able to control the robot. But what we're trying to do is actually take advantage of the natural gaze that they are exhibiting without forcing them to use their eye gaze as a remote control effectively. So the dream here is to have somebody eat at a restaurant with a social partner while still um, being able to take advantage of their eye gaze, right? So in social conversation, you know, you and I might be making eye contact, but then I might also look at my food. Some of that gaze is task related. Some of that gaze is social. And I don't want to um, force the user to use their eye gaze in a way that controls the robot. So we're actually specifically looking at this kind of challenging noisy signal because it's something that we get for free 
without having to train the user and without having to make them do a different task. Got it, got it. Great. Yeah. Thank, you. But thank you for the question. Um, great. And this brings me to sort of the end of the talk. Um, as I discussed at the beginning, um, we think about assistance, I think about my research as um, developing robot assistants that help people through space and time. I gave you a sense of uh, the different uh, components of these three axes, people, space, and time. Um, and I did it through three examples of uh, research from my lab of three different kinds of assistive robots. Um, obviously, none of this work happens without all of the students who are amazing, and uh, they do all the hard work. And so uh, the HARP lab is really a wonderful place to be. Um, and so I'll just leave you with this idea that if we want to build robots that assist people, um, we need to understand how the human behaviors that people are exhibiting tell us the who, where, and when of when assistance is required. So thank you. Fantastic. All right. Um, folks, questions. <clears throat> You're welcome to raise your hand and uh, use your uh, vocal cords if you choose to do so, <laughs> or you can um, <laughs> put it in the chat and or Kimberly will field YouTube uh, questions and I can ask. Uh, so we have one from uh, Sep. Actually, we also have, first of all, we have a comment from YouTube. Really cool. <laughs> there you go. Thanks. So, <laughs> that's already My a favorite kind of yeah. comment. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. That's a wonderful comment. Um, and then Sep asks, um, can you comment on the effect of um, the uh, the user's experience with the robot that they can teleoperate? Um, for example, with my own car, I don't look for the signal handles, gear, lever, volume button, but in a rental car, I repeatedly look for those things. Great. Wow. I don't know if you might not have heard that because my mic is good, but there's just a loud like trash oh. sound. <laughs> I hope it's the garbage. I hope it's the garbage uh, truck. And I think it was the garbage truck dropping. The <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yes, exactly. I think expertise plays a large role in the kinds of signals that we see. And in fact, this is something that we're exploring now, and I'm very excited about it, is this notion of mutual adaptation. So until now, um, I've been talking about this user model that we're trying to understand as this sort of static thing, that if we can just get enough signal, then we will be able to interpret what the user knows or what they prefer or what they want. But the reality is that as the robot is providing assistance to people, their own model is changing. So the way that they're giving us feedback, the signal that we're getting from them is going to be different. The best example of this is in the teleoperation, in the shared control case, I'm gonna skip back to that little movie. Um, so the, um, the teleoperated robot gets a lot more joystick signal than the shared autonomy robot, because a shared autonomy robot is taking over a lot of the task for you. And so it has less to go on when it's trying to predict your goal. Um, so we think that um, mutual adaptation is actually gonna be really critical in, in these um, kinds of tasks in order to continue to provide assistance. Um, and that yes, expertise is, uh, is gonna change things. And so the, the kind of the approach we're taking is an online learning kind of approach where uh, we're trying to continually um, adapt the model based on the new signals that we're getting in without forgetting what the robot has already learned, which is really hard. Definitely. Okay. Very interesting, actually. Yeah, I, can, I see future. Uh, Sep says thanks. I see future papers on this coming out. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> um, okay. If anybody else has questions, I have a couple. Uh, I'm going to shamelessly just ask. <laughs> Since, um, so maybe just zooming out, uh, Henny, I want the one thing that is really interesting, I think, I mean, amongst a huge number of things about your research is the fact that you are using mathematical modeling, of course, but you're also doing a very large number of user studies. How, how do you find it difficult to balance that? And how tedious, this is one thing that my lab, for example, has done very little of is you know, like actual re IRB review board stuff. It just seems really hard. <laughs> Are there any comments on that? And for, um, for future roboticists yeah. in industry and or academia, like is yeah. this, um, how do you, how do you, can you speed it up? No. Oh, you can't. can you speed it? Yeah. We, we've thought about it a couple of ways. I guess you ways. could pay so, people, but that's probably not kosher. <laughs> you, yeah, no, you can pay people. You can pay people. That's allowed. Um, so uh, yes, it is hard. Um, it is also incredibly critical because every time we put a robot in front of a person, we learn about a way that our assumptions were wrong. Um, and so in my lab, yeah, every research project ends up with some kind of user study 
either to find the information about the person that we need to use, for example, to collect the eye gaze that we want to train on, um, or and or to then evaluate the system that we've developed in front of a human being. Um, so yes, IRB studies are hard. I um, I am happy to talk to people about how to how to manage those studies. It's definitely a, a, a science and an art that most roboticists aren't given. Psychologists, for example, are highly trained in this kind of environment. Um, and we're seeing more and more that, um, you know, uh, venues like IROS and ICRA are starting to look for user studies where in the past they didn't really because, um, you know, a demonstration on the two grad students in the lab used to be enough. Um, it's it's less and less enough, and I think that's right. Um, I think we want to we want to recruit a big sample if we're going to make generalizable claims about the way our system works with people. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a challenge, and and COVID made it obviously really hard. It's hard to do HRI when you can't put the H and the R together. Um, yes. And so we have a, a lot of online studies in the recent work, but um, we're back in the lab, and so hopefully you'll see a lot more of people working with robots directly. Excellent. Okay, well, I actually, I, I don't, well, just we're a little bit over time, so I'll just I'll close quickly. But the only two things, I had one more thing to ask. Well, first of all, actually, if you only have two graduate students, then you have two data points. You can always get a nice linear fit, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Two> <laughs> one so perfect. You don't, well, you don't want, you don't want more samples. That, yeah, so that's what I was thinking. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, they're very fantastic work. Thanks so much for the talk. The only other thing I was going to mention, um, if you could actually, the, uh, the, the slide you have here, um, uh, with the yourself and um, uh, the other gentleman doing the tele -op. Could you just show yeah. that for one more second? Yeah, absolutely. With the yeah, video that was of me you. As a, me as a postdoc. Yeah, no, doing, I mean, actually, yeah, being, okay, so this, Yeah. I'd just like to point this out. Two things about this video. One, could you, new research idea for you, could you do facial tracking because you're, each of you is making a gesture to indicate, I think, the amount of cognitive input uh -huh. required to, I don't know, <laughs> to, to, to actually maneuver, that's one. Second of all, I would like to say that I, I think at the end of this, when you eat the marshmallow on, on your side, uh, I think you look a bit smug. Actually, I having really- beat, <laughs> Having beat the other uh, participant here, I think yeah. maybe there's some, that, that little, that snapshot <laughs> is- <laughs> <laughs> What you're seeing there is actually poor acting. I really don't like marshmallows, but they- Oh, okay. okay. They stick to the fork really well. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm trying to pretend like I enjoy it. And so what you see there is like, how long do I have to chew before I can spit Oh, uh, okay. So it's not even a pleasant, <laughs> it's not smug. It's actually just like, I, this is like a commercial where you have the product, you don't want to eat it, but you have to just eat it for the, oh, okay. For the research for the research. Studio, for the research. Uh, okay. So this is what everyone watching, this is what you get out of uh, talks. You get the secret details that are <laughs> like not publicized in the paper, right? That are, okay. So, okay. Um, okay. So we'll take one more from Seth and then I, I really, I, I don't want to keep people, but it's fantastic talk and fantastic questions. So let's just uh, um, ask one more. Uh, could the facial expressions be used as a signal for the happiness satisfaction of the user with the assistance uh, being provided? Uh, yeah. Maybe? Maybe, yeah, because um, on the one hand, people, we do know that there's a correlation uh, between expressed emotion, expressed facial expression and emotion. On the other hand, we also know that when people are alone or in front of technology with not in a social environment, that their facial expressions are very different. So like how many times have you looked at something funny on Instagram or TikTok and gone, huh, right? And like, it's funny. You think it's really funny. You type LOL, but you, you actually didn't laugh out loud. Um, so our, our facial expressions are not always reliable signals. Uh, they're much more useful when we're in social contexts, but it is possible. We do, we did, um, I track people and we saw that their pupil size changed when they were doing the teleoperation oh. task, which is a, a measure of cognitive load. So they were more loaded when they were teleoperating the robot, but we, we weren't able to make precise um uh, like inferences about that because we didn't control the ambient lighting and your pupil size is obviously also very affected by ambient lighting. But oh, we found wow. a trend toward being more cognitively loaded and actually getting a physiological signal for it. Okay, I'm impressed. I, I would have never considered the fact that there's a confound of like ambient lighting conditions. And, oh man. And it's, varying pupil size. It's wild, yeah. <laughs> oh, mm. Okay.
Uh, Professor Armani, thank you so much. Wonderful talk. We are grateful. We have a couple of one-on-one -on -one meetings coming up. We'll close for now. Thank the speaker. Uh, everyone, I think thank we had lots of thanks and, and, and props in the chat. So I think everyone loved it. Thank you so much for being available uh, this afternoon to talk to us. And uh, if anybody has questions or uh, uh, is interested in more work going on in the lab at CMU, um, Professor Armani has a great website, and personal and lab. So please check it out. Papers are there. <laughs> Read them, look, enjoy. Uh, it's fantastic. Okay, thanks everyone. We'll. Uh, we'll